Welcome, listeners, to another My Mind Mashups Deep Dive. Yes, welcome. This is where we uh, try to unravel some mysteries together, spark that curiosity, and yeah, make sense of some pretty complex ideas. And today, oh boy, we are definitely peering behind the curtain, a very sort of perfectly manicured curtain around the AI boom. Exactly. We're not just talking algorithms and cool tech today. We're really digging into the, let's say, the internal chaos, the politics, and this intense race for power that's happening right at the heart of AI. Yeah, a race that, I mean, it's genuinely reshaping, well, everything. Global economy, power structures, you name it. And there was that one moment, wasn't there, that really just, boom, laid it all bare. You mean back in 2023? The OpenAI saga. That's the one, that absolutely dramatic weekend. Sam Altman, the CEO, gets fired by his own board. Thawne, just like that. And then, what, days later? Yeah. He's back, reinstated after this huge flurry of panic, investors freaking out, employees threatening to walk. Right. And that wasn't just, you know, tech industry gossip, was it? Yeah. It really showed how fragile the governance can be when there are billions, maybe trillions, on the line. Billions, and maybe, as some people argue, the entire future of humanity, high stakes doesn't even begin to cover it. Which makes it the perfect jumping off point for our source material today. It really does. We're diving deep into Karen Howe's book, Empire of AI, Inside the Reckless Race for Total Domination. It's quite the title. And Karen Howe, I mean, she's the real deal, right? Award-winning journalist, MIT Technology Review, Wall Street Journal foreign correspondent covering AI in China specifically. Yeah, and she was named to the Time 100 AI list just recently in 2025, recognized for really shaping how the public understands this stuff. She brings serious investigative chops to this. Definitely, no fluff here. And her core argument, that's what makes this book, I think, so essential right now. She uses OpenAI's rise, this explosive growth, not just as a case study in tech success. No, it's more than that. Much more. She uses it as a prism, almost, to show how the whole AI industry is starting to function like, well, like an empire from history. An empire? How so? In the way it extracts resources, she talks about chips, data, energy, human labor, how it exploits that labor, often hidden away, and how it consolidates power incredibly quickly in the hands of just a few. Wow. And she backs this up. Oh, yeah. This isn't just opinion. She did over 300 interviews for this book. 300, okay. So our mission today really is to pull out some of the most surprising, maybe even shocking findings from that deep investigation. We wanna look at the hidden costs, you know, and who's really pulling the levers of control. Sounds fascinating yeah. and important. Uh, just a quick reminder for everyone listening, if you enjoy content that makes you think, maybe challenges your assumptions, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It really helps us out. So let's start with OpenAI's journey. It's quite a transformation, isn't it? When you look back at the beginning. Totally. They started as a nonprofit. The whole idea was openness, accessibility, serving humanity. Yeah. That was the mission. The word open was right there in the name. Yeah. Big signal. Exactly. But how she meticulously tracks how it shifted, how it became this, well, corporate giant really heavily backed by Microsoft. It's a classic story in some ways, isn't it? Mission drift. But the scale here is just different. Driven by what? The need for money. Huge amounts of capital, yeah. And the sheer speed of the race. If you want the best chips, the biggest models, the most data, you need scale. Serious scale. And that costs. Which is where Sam Altman comes in, according to Hal. Right. She paints him as this incredibly charismatic fundraiser, like the ultimate pitch guy. And his ability to bring in that money, coupled with his vision, allowed him to build up just immense operational control. Even though technically he reported to that nonprofit board. Exactly. The board was supposed to be the safeguard, right? Right. But Howell quotes someone in her interview saying, and this is pretty stark, every single person that has ever clashed with Altman's vision has left. Wow every single person. That suggests the board, that ethical firewall. It wasn't really in charge. It suggests that personality, vision, and crucially the money kind of overwhelmed the original structure, yep. which is concerning. Right, because if just a few individuals are really steering the ship, guiding the direction and the speed of AI development globally, then the benefits, and maybe more critically the costs, are likely gonna be very concentrated too. It challenges that whole idea of, you know, technology progressing in some nice decentralized way. And the speed is key here. To stay dominant, the ambition has to be off the charts. Absolutely. And how it gives us some context for that ambition? We're not talking about raising a few billion here or there. No. No. She reported on Altman's quest for funding that 
just he dwarfs entire national budgets. There were rumors reported in the book of him aiming for something like a $7 trillion war chest. Wait, $7 trillion, with a T. $7 trillion to truly cement global AI dominance. That number is, I mean, it almost doesn't compute, seven trillion. Right, and if that's the kind of money being talked about just to stay ahead. Then things like governance, ethics, openness, they risk becoming secondary concerns, don't they? Just obstacles to speed and scale. That seems to be the implication. And Howe argues this concentration of financial power, this drive for dominance, leads directly to the exploitation she talks about. Okay, so let's unpack that. This is her AI empire thesis. Yes. She argues this whole drive mirrors historical colonial patterns, specifically through extracting four key things. Chips, data, energy, and human labor. Chips, data, energy, human labor. Okay. When you list them like that, it suddenly sounds less clean and digital. It sounds resource intensive, almost industrial. Very much so. And let's focus on that last one for a second, human labor, because this is where she uses that really striking term, electronic colonialism. Electronic colonialism. What does she mean by that? What's the hidden labor? It's the work done by armies of low paid data workers, people whose job it is to clean up the messy raw data scraped from the internet and critically to moderate the content, to make the AI safe. Safe for us, the users in say North America or Europe. Precisely. To make an AI polite and helpful, humans first have to wade through the absolute worst stuff online. Violence, abuse, extreme pornography, hate speech, deeply disturbing content. And this isn't happening in shiny Silicon Valley offices, I take it. Not typically, no. Hauser reporting shows this essential, but frankly, often traumatizing, work is systematically outsourced, sent to places where labor is cheaper, Kenya, the Philippines, Venezuela are mentioned. So workers in the global south are basically filtering the internet's toxicity. For a fraction of Western tech salaries, yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. They absorb that digital trauma so that we get a clean chatbot experience. That's the dynamic how calls electronic colonialism. That term is heavy. It lands hard. How do these huge tech companies, according to how kind of, insulate themselves from the, well, the ethical fallout, the human trauma. Well, the sourcing suggests it's baked right into the model. You outsource it, use third-party contracting firms in countries maybe with weaker labor laws, fewer protections. Creates distance, plausible deniability. It creates systemic distance, yeah, between the polished AI product and the often brutal human effort required to make it, the trauma, the psychological toll on those workers, which Hollow documents can be severe, that's the hidden foundation. But the liability, the responsibility, it stays kind of out there, outside the main company. It's really jarring, isn't it, to think that the polite, helpful response you get from a chatbot might be built on, well, quite literally, human suffering somewhere else. It forces you to reconsider the whole ecosystem. And the extraction isn't just human, right? You mentioned energy and resources. Yeah. The environmental footprint must be enormous, especially if we're talking $7 trillion ambitions driving this race. Oh, absolutely enormous. Training these huge AI models and then running them constantly, it takes staggering amounts of resources. Like electricity. Massive amounts of electricity and water. Huge quantities of water are needed for cooling these massive data centers that run 24-7. How massive are we talking? Does Hal give numbers? She includes some projections that are, well, eye-opening. One estimate she cites suggests that by 2030, AI operations could consume up to 8% of total U.S. electricity demand. 8% of all U.S. power. That's, that's the level of entire countries. Exactly. It's an incredible burden on the grid. And crucially, Howe argues these environmental costs aren't shared equally either. How so? Well, where do you build massive data centers? Often where land is cheap, where water is accessible, maybe where environmental regulations are a bit looser? So potentially vulnerable communities again, often in the global south. That's the pattern the sourcing suggests. It can lead to things like water depletion in areas already facing scarcity. Howell draws this direct line, almost a global supply chain of extraction. Connecting what? Connecting, say, lithium mines in Chile. You need lithium for the hardware to those data annotation hubs in Kenya to the enormous power draw of data centers may be built near crucial water sources, all feeding this relentless quest for AI dominance spearheaded by figures like Altman. It's a truly global empire in that sense, touching everywhere. That's the argument. It's systemic. This sheer scale, the systemic costs, it really forces you to look at the why. 
what's driving people inside these companies. Howell apparently reported on some internal conflicts at OpenAI. Yeah, she gets into those sort of philosophical tensions, describes employees who seem to bounce between these almost utopian hopes for what artificial general intelligence or AGI could achieve. Like solving all humanity's problems. That kind of thing, utopian visions. But then at the same time, harboring this deep fear that the very thing they're building could lead to, well, human extinction. So salvation or apocalypse, nothing in between. It creates this really fascinating kind of intense internal pressure. People working flat out to build something they simultaneously think might destroy us all. How do they cope with that? Well, household sources suggest that sometimes the pursuit of AGI itself starts to function almost like a like a quasi-religious belief system. A belief system. Why would that be necessary? Is it just corporate rah-rah or something more? Mm -hmm. The analysis implies it might be a coping mechanism if you genuinely believe you're building something world-saving or potentially world-ending. It elevates the mission, right? Makes it seem almost sacred. Exactly. It elevates it above normal concerns, mm -hmm. above standard corporate accountability, maybe even above ethics sometimes. That kind of belief structure could potentially justify taking huge risks, cutting corners, ignoring those human or environmental costs we just talked about. Because the stakes in their minds are existential. It's bigger than anything else. That seems to be the idea, which, you know, can be quite dangerous if that power isn't checked. Absolutely. And uh, if this deep dive is resonating with you, making you think, maybe hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our next exploration. We'd love to have you along. Yeah, please do. So this tension, how it describes salvation versus catastrophe, it brings us right back to that core question, the one posed by Hao and reviewers of her work. If AI promises a better future, the question is, a better future for whom? That really is the nub of it, isn't it? The fundamental bias question. How does Helzo explain that risk? She argues that because the funding is concentrated, the development teams are often fairly homogenous, and the data sets themselves reflect historical biases. The AI models that result are inevitably built to reflect the needs and experiences of those who create them. So primarily the needs and experiences of, say, wealthy Silicon Valley engineers and their backers. That's the risk. And if the AI reflects only their worldview, their priorities, then huge swaths of the global population, maybe especially those communities involved in the resource extraction or the data labeling we talked about, they risk being left out of the benefits entirely. Or worse, actually harmed by biased algorithms making decisions about their lives. Loans, jobs, healthcare, policing, the potential impact is massive. Right, so to really grasp Howe's contribution, it helps to place her work alongside other big books on AI, doesn't it? How does Empire of AI compare? That's a good point. You've got different angles. For instance, someone like Ethan Mollick, his book, Co-Intelligence, is much more focused on the practical side. How can you, the user, work with AI? It's about collaboration, amplification. More of a how-to or how to think about it guy. Yeah, very user-centric, very practical. Then you have the other extreme, maybe someone like Elias Dudkowski. The strong AI safety or existential risk proponent. Exactly. His arguments are often quite polemical, focusing almost entirely on the speculative risk risk of AGI becoming uncontrollable, leading to catastrophe. He calls for bans, hard stops. It's very focused on that potential future danger. So where does Howe fit between the practical guide and the apocalyptic warning? Howe does something different, I think. She really grounds the entire discussion in the present, in current realities. While Moloch looks at user collaboration and Yudkowsky looks at future existential threats, Howe is looking at the now. At the structures being built today. Precisely corporate governance failures, actual global resource extraction happening right now, the lack of accountability today. She details this empire structure that isn't hypothetical. She argues it's already operating, already extracting value, already imposing costs. So less about a potential future apocalypse, more about the costly domination happening in the present. That's a good way to put it. She brings it down to earth, focusing on power, money, and consequences in the here and now. Okay, so wrapping up then, what's the final verdict on Empire of AI? What should listeners take away? I'd say it's a really meticulously reported piece of work. It's, yeah. well, it's pretty jaw-dropping in places. It definitely strips away that glossy hype that surrounds AI. Gets beneath the surface. Deep beneath. It exposes the, uh, the relentless competition, sure, but also the hidden sacrifices, human and environmental, that are propping the whole thing up. And the central metaphor, the empire. Does it hold up? You know, some reviewers acknowledged it can feel a bit 
heavy-handed at times, that colonial metaphor. But even if you debate the label, the evidence how it presents the detailed critique of extraction, exploitation, power consolidation. That part is vital. It demands serious attention from policymakers, from the public, from all of us, really. So it serves as a necessary corrective, a call for more scrutiny. Definitely. A powerful call for stronger oversight, yeah. And it really challenges that easy assumption that just because something is technologically advanced, it automatically means progress for everyone. Progress for whom? Back to that question. Always back to that question. And how is book, it doesn't just diagnose the problem. Her narrative kind of ends with this call to action, a call for a more democratic AI movement. Democratic AI? Mm -hmm. Given everything she's described, yeah. is that even possible? Well, that leads us perfectly into the final provocative thought we want to leave you, the listener, with today. Okay, lay it on us. Given everything, how documents this extreme concentration of power, the vast proprietary infrastructure built on global resource extraction, the sheer mind-boggling scale of funding needed, like that potential $7 trillion Altman figure. Yeah. Is it actually possible to democratize a technology built like that? built on such vast, consolidated power? Or is it inevitable that power will just keep consolidating, keep concentrating among the very few who can afford that astronomical price of admission? Hmm. Will power inevitably consolidate? Or can we steer it differently? That's the multi-trillion dollar question, isn't it? And it's one that should really challenge all of us and hopefully shape the debates around regulation and innovation for the next decade. A huge thank you for joining us on this deep dive. We really hope we've sparked some curiosity today, maybe challenged an assumption or two, and expanded your understanding. Absolutely. And please like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this. It helps more people find these conversations. We want to hear more My Mind Mashups deep dives, right? We do. And definitely drop your thoughts in the comments. What do you think about democratizing AI? Is it feasible? Your perspective could genuinely shape where we go next. We read them all. You can find My Mind Mashups everywhere you get your podcasts and audio. Amazon Music, Audible, Facebook, Pocket Cast, Spotify, YouTube, you name it. Until next time. Keep questioning those assumptions and keep expanding your understanding. Thanks for listening.